Terry, thank you for talking to us on the Presenter Academy. It's good to have you here. And um, you come in, in well, I was going to say two guys. He's probably more than two almost because you've, you've been a presenter on many radio stations and you've interviewed many superstars, but you also run radio stations. You now run a whole group, don't you? I do, yeah. It makes me sound like I've been uh, quite busy over the last 30 years, but I've been really lucky because I was able, and you will know this, Pat, it's a unique opportunity that you can work both on air and off air, and very few people manage to carve out a career, and indeed, you know, for 30 years I've been a player manager, and it's only been in the last year working for UTV as the group programme director there that I've actually not been on the air, and whilst I loved doing the shows, and when I was a colleague with you at Smooth, I absolutely adored that time, but actually, um, running the radio stations, being part of the fabric, understanding how you kind of come up with a concept, having an idea in the shower and hearing it on air at lunchtime, those are the exciting things that I, uh, that I really am enjoying. Well, I should think anybody who has an idea in the shower is open to enjoyment. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you can put it on the air. That's <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, before we get into your, your management side of things, let's talk about your radio interviews, because if people go to terryunderhill.com, they'll be able to get a little montage of some of the things you've done, and I think they'll be amazed at not only your skill of doing them, but at the people you've spoken to. I mean, you can be um, a little bit flash now in what you say, but didn't Robbie Williams pay you a bit of a compliment, as in, that was the best interview I think I've ever done? Yeah, he did say that. Shortly afterwards, it all went horribly wrong, but absolutely did say that. And in fact, it's funny, you, you, I mean, at the risk of dropping names, only the week ago, um, I was with a couple of people and, and, uh, and chatting to Robbie Williams and reminded him that he'd said that. Um, it was one of those things, really, that I'll give you some of the things I do, and these are, these are the sort of um, secrets, really, of the way that I like to do interviews. Now, I'm not saying that this is the best way. I'm not saying it's the only way. What I'm saying is that for me to get some quite unique content from these people, I've employed it for years, and it's always worked. And I'll tell you some amazing stories. I'll tell you, remind me to tell you the Ozzy Osbourne story, which is just absolutely incredible and not a story I've told before. But with, with Robbie Williams and with other artists, what I do is I will read as much information, not just the press release that comes from the record company that ask you, or rather tell you things they want you to ask. I'll delve into it. I read three biographies, one uh, official autobiography and two biographies on Robbie Williams before doing the interview. And the tricks I like to employ is I then I read it just as if I was doing an exam when I was in, in school, and then I'll remember all the stuff that I want to ask. And then I approach it just like... If, I, if you were ever able to bump into him in the pub and the things that you really want to know are probably the things that listeners want to know. I try to avoid the things that everybody asks, the usual questions, you know, at the time he was just, it was rumoured that he was going to get back, we'd take that. But everybody was asking that question. I didn't have to ask because I led him down a certain road and he told me things that nobody else had, had got. But then there's some subliminal tricks. I'll never wear headphones when I do the interviews. If I have to hold a mic, I kind of hold it so they don't even notice that I've got the microphone there. There's no notes there whatsoever. So what it becomes is a conversation, and their guard drops so quickly. And every single celebrity is trained, and some of them are formally trained, some of them just pick it up over the years. And they have a very technical gadget. You'll, you'll be aware of this. They have a gadget called the bullshit detector. <laughs> And you've got to get that down before you start to get the good stuff. And sometimes you need to talk about their new album and their new single first. However you edit it when it goes out the other way around is, is something you can do. But you start off giving them a big plug that they want and then they can relax. They know they've had the plug for their album or their book. And then you just go straight in and start talking about stuff in their lives. And, um, and for me, that's always worked. And certainly getting stuff, I, I mean, the Ozzy Osbourne one, which, if you're interested, it's, it's, I, I, mean, I, I mean, this is one of my favorite sort of anecdotal stories. But um, basically, I was interviewing Ozzy Osbourne. He was doing three interviews. It was for a book that was coming out. And I was um, seeing him for half an hour with him, which was a very long time, really. You normally get about 10, 15 minutes. But they gave me half an hour for a special. And... Um, during the course of the interview, again, usual tricks, I'd read all the books, I didn't have a microphone, no headphones, we were chatting away, and he started to tell me the most fascinating things, things that even though I'd read all this stuff about him, I didn't know. But he told me one, this is where I'm going to really hook and tease you, he told me one story that I was just absolutely astounded to hear. It was one of those stories that I knew would have been on the front page of The Sun the following morning. It would probably have been on Sky News. It was, going to, it was such a very big deal. So I completed the interview. Thank you very much, I'll see you. Off we go. I got in the taxi on the way from the studio where I'd done the interview in London, and I'm listening through to the interview on my headphones, 
And I thought, did he really tell me that story? And, and he had. And then I panicked and I thought, you know what, this, this is not a story that should be out there. And it's not a story that I want to go down in history as sort of causing a massive problem for him and in particular for, for, for Sharon. And I decided to make a phone call to the, to the guy at the studio who wasn't in there when I did the interview. And I spoke to, the, to his sort of manager, the guy that was looking after him at the time. And I told him what had happened. I said, you didn't hear the interview. I said, but Ozzy told me this story. And I told him what the story was. And there was silence on the other end of the phone, complete silence. And uh, I said, I'm happy to cut it out. I'm happy to completely erase the interview. Bring my copy there now. Make sure that the studio uh, cut their copy out as well. And he said, if you would do that, I cannot thank you enough. So I, I turned the taxi around, went back to the studio. As I walked in, this guy said to me, thank you so much for coming back. We edited it. We cut that bit out, complete references to it. The guy said to me, I've got somebody on the phone for you. He gave me the phone. It was Sharon. And, he, and he, this guy told Sharon, you know, what I'd done to thank me sincerely. You know, thank you so much for doing that. You didn't have to. And we appreciate it. And Ozzy walked in. And Ozzy, of course, we all know it's medical. It's not now drug induced it's just a medical condition where he really finds it difficult he was very ebullient very conversational in the interview and he came over to me and um and he said oh thank you man oh i didn't realize i was being interviewed i, I forgot and that was the key and i thought <laughs> you know what if you can get them to forget they're being interviewed that's when you get the good stuff brilliant so what did he say i can't, <laughs> I can't tell you but it might be in my book <laughs> i'm going to tell you privately over a, a lemonade Okay. It's interesting what you say about the headphones and stuff, because quite often a guest who's coming in might actually wear the headphones themselves, and yet you as the, the interviewer aren't, are not wearing them. Yeah. I always say to them in, in a studio, I mean, I always prefer, believe this or not, I prefer to do interviews not in a studio. Um, I mean, the, the, the Robbie Williams interview you, you referred to is at the Mandarin Oriental in a, in a suite there. Um, the Ozzy Osbourne was in a studio, but I just did, I didn't wear them, and therefore he didn't wear them. I just think it's a barrier. It's an unnatural scenario. You know, if they're wearing headphones and you're wearing headphones, it's not natural. Um, and certainly all the, all the sort of, the one, all the interviews that I'm quite proud of, um, you know, the, the, whether it's the, um, the Phil Collins interview uh, where he cried or whether it's the Aussie one or whether it's the Robbie Williams one, which as you, you know, heard about, they've always been that way. Well, I think people are definitely going to have to have a peep at terryunderhill.com now to see what this is all about if they haven't heard them, aren't they? Well, they can have a listen. There's a little montage there, yeah. I mean, it's, it is only a small snapshot. I mean, there's a bit of George Michael in there, a bit of Ozzy Osbourne that you just heard, some Kylie. Um, obviously, there's the, the Robbie Williams clip as well. Um, take that, lads. Um, so there was... There was I, I, I always see interviews as a really... I, I love doing interviews. I mean, I, I love talking to people. You know that, you know, and, and it's just great to... Um, to be able to, to have an opportunity to talk to people that in some cases, I mean, I remember, yeah, some of these people I grew up listening to, even I grew up listening to, you know, imagine for me interviewing Elton John, for example, who I was a huge Elton John fan, and I've interviewed him twice, and those occasions are big moments, and for him, it's one of 500 interviews he's going to do this year. For me, it's the most important moment, potentially, of my career, and people watching this now, all the, uh, the young girls and the young guys who hopefully will go on to have great careers in, in, the, in the radio or television industry, they will also have moments that they will never forget. And, and, you know, and I think some of, the, some of the big stars, I always say the bigger the star, the nicer they are, because the big ones get it, and they know. They, and your, your biggest would be probably the one who you're the biggest fan of, wouldn't it be Barry Manilow? Gosh, you've done your research with no notes. Um, yeah, I mean, I get ridiculed um, over Barry, um, and probably quite right that I do. But you've got to remember that um, when he had a hit in, um, with Mandy in the 70-whatever year it was, you know, he was at the time, the cool, he was the Ed Sheeran of that moment. You know, he was the Michael Bublé, if you like, of that moment. And he was this huge star. My mum and dad absolutely loved him. And I thought his songs were quite good. And I ended up, even before I worked in radio, by the way, in the 70s, I was still in school. And I wrote a documentary called The Boy from Brooklyn, which was the story of his life. And I just got all, before the internet, you know, I was getting clips of taped interviews that he'd done in America and getting them posted to me and all this kind of rubbish, really. But put it together how could I ever know that sort of five or six years later sitting at his house in Palm Springs California and he'd heard the interview and actually over the last 25 years I've interviewed him about 15 or 20 times and uh, and the last time was in November the year before last and um, you know you never become you, you they sort of know you 
but I mean, we, he's not on my mobile phone. He's not a personal friend. But you know, certainly whenever he's in the UK, um, I, I get a call and I'm always go and say hello to him, and uh, and that's quite nice. Is it harder, Terry, to interview somebody if you're a fan? Um, I don't get starstruck now, um, so no, it's not. But I would recommend that people doing their first series of interviews don't target their their favourite artists. You know, cut your teeth on artists you don't really care about and that you don't really have any sort of interest or affinity in, because then you won't be starstruck. It's just another artist. Arguably, you know, the best people to interview for your first series of interviews are people you don't really like that much because you're not going to have any sort of nerves. You're not going to be worried about the interview or how it will go. There's no nothing riding on it. For me, you know, um, it's not an issue. The Elton John one was the closest to me being. I mean, that was quite interesting. That was at uh, the Holland Park Hotel, which is just over the road from where he lives. And uh, this is the first interview I'd done with him. And he was doing three interviews. One was with um, Dr. Fox, actually. Uh, one was with Steve Wright and one was with me. I can't believe I got the interview. You know, this was quite a few years ago. And um, I was typically third, you know. I, I either like to go first or last, by the way. I never like to go in the middle. So I was quite happy I was last. And Neil Fox came out and said, uh, oh, he's, he's in a great mood, he's, he's in great form. And I'd been told beforehand that if he's right up to the moment of the interview, if he goes into one of his bad moods, it might not happen. So I thought, I hope Steve Wright and Neil Fox didn't upset him too much, you know, I'm sitting there. And Neil came out and said, he's in great form, it's all fine. So I was sitting in a sort of side room, and the interviews were in the main suite of this hotel. And suddenly I could hear him shouting on the phone. I thought, oh, God, here we go. You know, this is my hero. And he's shouting at somebody. And he was actually talking to, it turned out, the producer of his next record about the order that the songs were going to come up on the, on the album. And he was shouting. And I'm thinking, oh, God, I, this is just not going to happen. And then as he shouted louder, it seemed that he was getting closer. And I, and I turned around and he'd walked into the room that I was in and ushered me through. And I, and I said, you know, you could, okay, yes, I followed him through, you know, so I sat down. And, and then he put the phone down and he said, um, I think, have you heard the album? And I said, yeah, yeah, I think the album's great. It's a, it's a great album. I mean, you're not going to tell him Johnny's album's rubbish. So, but it was a good album. Anyway, uh, he said, he wants to, play, um, I forget the titles, but he said he wants to play that as the third track. I never have an up-tempo song as the third track. It's always a ballad. Don't you agree? Yes, I agree, Elton. And, and, and then it was fine. And actually what that did for me, it cut the ice. It made me not nervous because, you know, we'd sort of broken the ice in a different way, if that makes sense. Absolutely, it does. What about when you're, when you're dealing with, as you say, with Elton, with tantrums and tiaras, as that TV show he did was called many years ago, and it showed him in a bad mood. Um, touchy subjects. Do you dare broach a touchy subject with Elton, even though that's what his management have told you not to talk about? Would you do it? My advice to, bear in mind who this is aimed at, this conversation with you and I is aimed at, my advice is, if the moment is right, you'll know, but don't go out there to make yourself a star. I've got some audio which I might share with you, right, and it's not me, it's an interview with somebody interviewing Mick Hucknall from Simply Red. Now Mick is quite difficult to interview, I've interviewed him a few times and never had a problem, but you have to, he's a bit like a wild animal, and if you if you nudge him the wrong way, he will just explode. And I've got some audio of an interview that he did, which is just, it's, you will cringe when you hear it. Now, with Elton John, and, and basically the, the reason I told you about Mick Hucknall was that the guy had started straight off asking him a question that was a particularly difficult subject. It was about his support of Labour Party just after Gordon Brown had, uh, had, had got the boot from the Labour Party, or just got the job or something. Now, if I had gone straight in and said, I mean, the thing you referred to is Robbie Williams that sort of almost got me in trouble, certainly got us on the front page of every newspaper in the world and me live on Sky News at five to talk about the Robbie Williams interview was that I had asked him a question about drug taking. And I had said to him, were they good times in your life? Uh, would you do it again? You know, what was the, what was it all about? And he, he replied honestly because he, the guard was down and he'd forgotten he was being interviewed. and. He said that taking drugs was the best time of his life and he'd do it again if they didn't make him fat. Well, this exploded all over the world. I was getting caught, I had to turn the phone off. I was getting calls from all over the world. Now, in hindsight, I did not set out to get my name in the paper for asking Robbie Williams a tricky question. I, I didn't, that wasn't the plan. It just that the interview went that way. But if you go out determined to ask a question, for me, it's, as much as they forget they're being interviewed, I sometimes can forget that I'm doing the interviews, which is good. 
but you have to be very responsible when you put the stuff on. I did talk to Elton John, for example, about the time that he was forced to come out as gay in the early 70s. And uh, I asked him, to, so I didn't want, I wanted to talk about that, but didn't sort of want to, I didn't want to embarrass him, not that he'd be embarrassed, but I didn't want to ask him in an awkward way. So I simply said, because uh, I had read an article sometime before my interview that in certain parts of America, in the Deep South and so on, he still can't sell tickets and he still can't sell albums. There are certain parts of America where because he is openly gay, he cannot sell a ticket. and doesn't ever go there, never performs there. And I'd read this article, you see. So I actually said to him, and, and we've, we've done all the bullshit, album's great, everything's wonderful, blah, blah, blah. And then I knew the moment was right, and he was settled down. He did the whole interview lying down. He said, do you mind if I lie down on a chaise long? I said, as long as you don't want me to lie with you. Uh, so I sat next to him doing the interview. And, and I could see he was going well, and I just said to him, I said, you know, it must have been really difficult for you in the 70s when the editor of Rolling Stone asked you if you were gay and for you to give the answer. Was that a difficult answer to give or not? And he thought about it for a few seconds, and I don't think he'd thought about it since he did it. And he said, at the time, it was easy to be honest and answer, but there are times since where I perhaps wish I hadn't. And I thought, wow, that is a really revealing piece of content, you know, and, he, and I, I quite enjoyed asking the question. Mm -hmm. But in answer to the question, don't ask tough questions just to make a name for yourself because you're more likely the artist will walk out or you're more likely to get yourself a reputation as somebody who won't get interviews in the future. Part of the reason I went back over the Aussie one, Sharon is and was an enormously powerful person in the music industry. And I did not want my reputation out there as, you know, Terry Underhill will stitch you up. And I, I didn't want to risk that.